This is Vasu. No, no I can't. No, no, we can't see. And there is something which I need to do here, I think. Yeah, yeah. You have to start the video. Uh, the video, na. Huh? Where do where do I go? Ah, uh, so this see, is. See, if you if uh, are you in are you in laptop or desktop or in mobile? I want the mobile. Okay, so uh, are you seeing that uh, video icon next to your mic? You will see a mic icon and a video icon. That video icon, you. No, I should, can't. Should be in the bottom. Anyway, I can. I can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Done. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we are starting the program. I request everyone to be on mute. So the uh, format uh, today, just to give a brief, it's a conversation. So the initial part of conversation, um, we would request everybody to be on the mute. So if you have questions, you can put it in the chat like we normally do. So after the conversation is over, we will take the questions, you know, based on the time and availability one by one. Okay. And uh, a very warm good evening to all of you. Thank you very much uh, for attending this program today. This is the 40th week of NETOX. So last year, May 2020, when the lockdown was just rolling in, that is the time we started this program. And we are very happy to have a special person, a legendary artist, uh, Ms. Rega Rodvidya, with us today. So normally you would have seen 25th, 30th, 40th kind of NETOX, we normally get a special guest and curate a special program. And we have our curator, Sujit, in conversation with Rega Ji today. Now, uh, I will do the honors of uh, introducing Regaji, which is actually a formal assignment. Otherwise, all the people who are here know her pretty well. I know that it's more of a formality, but still, uh, let me do that. Um, Regaji is an artist, independent curator, writer, and more importantly, a teacher. She did a BFA in painting from MS University, Baroda in 76-81. And then she studied and practiced photography during 78, 81. And then further, she went on to Royal College of Art London as part of INLAC scholarship. Then she studied film and video at Fulham Institute London again. And then she completed MA in painting from Royal College of Art London. And then she has 38 solo exhibitions to her credit. That is what I could count. So the last four decades of illustrious career and then 100 plus group shows in all parts of the world, Singapore, Italy, Sweden, US, Australia, South Korea, UK, Taipei, Japan, Algeria, France, Brazil, Switzerland, Cuba, where not? And then she has participated in art fairs and residencies across the world, almost most of the prestigious shows. She was invited as faculty in many universities, including Heron College, MS University, Baroda, and then also University of Hyderabad, Chitragala Parishad, Bangalore, Fine Arts College, Trivandrum, then institutes in Sweden, France, Netherlands, many more. And she is a person who has lectured on art maybe for quite some time and in many parts. And I could also see she started off with talking about art in select villages in Kerala. I think there is some connect between Narasharthu and her at that point. And then uh, again, many parts of the world, UK, Sweden, France, Italy, many places she has uh, gone and lectured about art. Most importantly, she runs collective studio at Baroda, all of you know which has been an incubation center for many young artists, some of who are big names in the contemporary Indian art scenario. And that uh, studio also does the residency program and also does support initiative for artists. She has curated several shows, participated in several workshops and camps. And then uh, she has uh, done a film actually in conversation with Jodi, but it's available in YouTube. I think 14 episodes of that. She has part, she's been part of several cultural trips to again, many countries in the world uh, as per invitation from the governments and part of government delegations and all. 
and she's governing body member and advisor of several prestigious organizations and she's also jury member for many art awards and her artworks are documented in many journals magazines newspapers and publications most of you might know that and her blog most of you may know otherwise i would cut and paste that in the chat window is pretty noted and a talking point among artists and artist fraternity i would stop at that point thank you very much rega ji a warm welcome from team narachatu welcome to new talks 40th edition over to you sujit thank you so much sadish thank you uh, uh, to sadish bhai and uh, narachatu for having me uh, in this conversation and thank you very much uh, rega ji for accepting our invitation and <laughs> ready to talk to us and uh, i'm really glad and uh, honored to have a conversation with you and i learned certain thing so uh, let's begin something which which is a basic uh, uh, questions which, uh, which i want we, we would like to know when did you really felt that uh, you wanted to be a a painter especially you you always mention that you wanted to be a painter not artist like uh, or, uh, uh, we are very specific in in that way so you wanted to be a painter and uh, is there any particular event which you can recollect that like that makes you that like suddenly you feel that like i wanted to be a painter uh, first of all thank you all for having me and um, who can say no to sujit so oh, <laughs> thank you <laughs> Thank you. Um, my utter pleasure. Uh, you know, Sujit, I've said this very often. Um, uh, you know, I, I, and I, unfortunately, will have to repeat it here again. But yeah. I grew up on an air force base with, yeah. in sort of in a kind of isolation, and uh, I didn't go to school for seven years. I was uh, homeschooled, and um, it's quite an isolated kind of an existence especially in those days uh, my father was a fighter pilot in the air force and so we were really in remote locations so my, though i had an older sister and she was going to school i think you know my preoccupations at home was to be kept you know occupied and drawing particularly became something extremely crucial to my life and um, and i think that that's the sort of seminal point um and i you know i've said this again that you know from the age of 5 i always said that i wanted to be an art, a painter not an artist but a painter yeah and i think that you know when you're young uh, your parents indulge you and we were very very uh, precious girl children to our to my parents and so i think they sort of saw this as something that was uh, uh, what a child would articulate about a desire and mm-hmm. so that desire was nurtured nothing sort of thought of more greatly than other parents would nurture their children's uh, yep. but it remained with me and i think that you know the point i find uh, in reflection is that i suppose for me uh, drawing in particular i think that that's quite uh, sort of obvious in all my my work over these many decades is that though people think of me as a sort of colorist and that i you know have, have work that is very very you know uh uh on quite decorative in in many instances uh or considered that way actually the 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 structure of my existence in within art is the drawn factor and so the sort of unseen linearity to my work is always there and i think that um you know it's something that i uh, delight in and so i think i i um i say in a jocular way that maybe i was so that i had nothing else to do and that art hmm. is my calling who knows uh, but i think that uh, for me um, it wasn't because i was located in baroda either that uh, therefore i went to the faculty of fine arts i would have come to this faculty because it was really quite renowned it was wonderful that my my location happened to be baroda um i i'm also very really grateful in many ways to the kind of environment that both i grew up in and that you know later became the other playground of my my growth because you really grow within family and institutions educational institutions and i'm somebody who really does pay a great deal of homage to my education mm-hmm. which in many ways is of course your academic space but also much wider than that 
uh, but which comes from the, the space of teachers in some ways. And so I think that, um, you know, uh, I found my belonging. I often say this, uh, and it may sound very sort of overly lyrical, but it is actually such a you know, complete truth for me. You know, I was all of 17 years old, you know, from uh, uh, um, straight out of school. And I, in fact, came into an environment in Baroda where there were a lot of mature, uh, art, you know, artists who had finished some degree or the other, you know, whether it was literature, whether it was philosophy. And there I was, I, you know, straight out of school with my two flats and, you know, uh, um, the silliness of my ideas, but with this great desire and this great belief and where the, where the, the space of, 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 Understanding the world always came from this, uh, this space of me withdrawing, whether in some book or whether, and what those drawings were really in many ways were irrelevant. They were nothing that you could consider, you know, had the, had the, the uh, prophecy of me being anything, just a child who, who would scribble away. But, I, but what I remember so vividly is I had my little drawing board sort of tucked under my arm, you know, my little jola, and I walked through the Faculty of Fine Arts Gates, and in that moment and in that instant, I just felt that I had come home, you know, mm -hmm. and I come from this wonderful background of this wonderful family environment, but extremely revered child, extremely beloved. So it wasn't that, you know, I had any kind of, uh, you know, traumatic spaces that where I needed to belong somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I also had to have to mention uh, in, in, you know, in, in location to your inquiry, that I really think it's, it's, um, it's the love of a teaching that also uh, seduces the learner. Yep. And I was so uh, I was so lucky to have the belief, uh, irrespective of what my capabilities were. I mean, who's to know what some seventeen-year-old child, uh, amongst a host of other uh, people? But I had this sort of belief that was gifted to me. Um, whether it was from, you know, uh, somebody like Subramaniam or Jyoti Bhatt or Gulam Mohammed Sheikh or Nasreen Mohammadi, you know, it wasn't that they sort of sought me out, but it was be the fact that they believed that every student who was there deserved and uh, was required to receive from them. Yeah. So I, I had the privilege of this kind of nurturing, you know, and I think that you become what you want to be, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if you desire to be something, it's not necessarily that you come with sort of great skills, yeah. but you bring your desire, you bring your desire because in some ways to answer your question more pointedly, I think that for me, being an artist, you know, being a painter, because that's what really I do. To paint is what uh, provides me a vocabulary mm -hmm. with which to talk to myself, with which to reflect with myself, yeah. and thereby to reflect with an outer world, you know? Yeah. Because the self belongs in an outer world. So when you converse with yourself, mm -hmm. you are in many ways conversing with an outer world. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So I, 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 that was my second question, actually, you answered, uh, you know, the, there was a wrong notion in, uh, in the society, you know, or, or, or a parameter or a, or, or a yardstick, which is skill, you know, like if one has skill, then it's a little more easy to enter into art because uh, people like the society itself, you know, like create a or out of it, like you have a skill, you have this, so you can be, you can be a painter, you know, so that uh, that even that advantage you didn't get it, you know, like so. <laughs> that was my second question, like uh, uh, you answer. But how your classmates, your colleagues, uh, inspired you? Like um, there was a great number of uh, artists, um, uh, you know, they are all established in, in a way, like um, from Kerala, especially uh, many of them are from like, and also the the time of uh, radical and. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So how do you, how they inspire you as a mm, mm, as an artist? You know, it's interesting you you put that out because I think that we often talk about that. My partner Surendran and myself, we often sort of talk about yep. that was a kind of there was a different India we belonged to, and I think. when you uh, if we are talking about in any sort of generational positioning i think obviously you have to look at the location of the politics at the time uh, and uh, and to to use a sort of rather for you know a word that can be slightly loosely used the energies of the time no mm-hmm. so i think that uh, india was a simpler india not necessarily politically but it was a simpler india because you didn't have the sort of intervention of uh, um social media you know <laughs> and so um uh, not to say uh, it's a it's a pheno- fantastic phenomenon but in terms yeah. of how we had to see and find the world we had to find it in a very different way there wasn't a press of the button no yeah. you didn't have anything you used post you used postcards you know you had to apply somewhere you had to send you had to wait Econ- the economy was very different so when you talk about you know what was the rigors of that time rather than inspiration because uh, let me just politely say that's a word i i sort of slightly avoid uh, what the rigors of that time for me as an individual was the fact of uh, you know uh, wearing your belief on your on your sleeve you could wear your heart Mm-hmm. Uh, and therefore your desires and your intentions much more openly and far less guardedly and i think that it made something much more uh um much more palpable where discourse was so much more respected and so mm-hmm. much more sought you know you were not looking to see which curator was coming and which museum director is coming and you know which gallerist the galleries are wonderful you were looking at your peer group as the trampoline and the the tapestry within which you were to weave yourself into mm-hmm. and and you know there were times when i suppose any onlooker would have thought that we were all rabidly fighting with each other but we weren't in the beauty of that time in many ways and which really for me as an individual was one of the greatest uh, parameters of learning was the ability to have a very rapid discourses you know you could have fiery and feisty discourses which were never personal yeah. they were to do with things related to the way you held your concerns about life and and because you were a painter because you were an artist because you were an art student uh whatever those you know whichever label fits fits you at that time you you know uh uh interjected and mm-hmm. you were not you know bothered about the sense of image and mm-hmm. you know whether it would be seen as uh something that would be uh, politically correct you just wore your concerns and your politics with great um with great feistiness mm-hmm. now in fact you know you talk about my peers sort of stretch rather like an umbrella because i would have to take into consideration my rca colleagues as well as you know you know i have artist friends all over the world and uh, i have been most fortunate in that but if i just stick to the initial in you know uh, years of being uh, a student at the faculty of fine arts so i just take that because that's really the womb at which within which we all grew mm-hmm. uh, the one of the most interesting things at that time uh was that there was no such thing as uh hierarchies within um uh, there was a lot of interdisciplinary uh engagement mm. so you know you would go at your chai break and you would see subramaniam sitting and with his half cig- you know smoked cigarette which you're watching the ash about to fall off and he would be sitting in the print making department and vr patel would be doing a silk screen that was you know related to subramaniam and somebody else would be there and some visiting person would be there so maybe there would be gif patel and then there'd be jutendra jain coming in and there'd be a quick sudden you know impetuous uh uh gathering you'd be suddenly given information that oh timothy hyman is going to be speaking today they're having a chat mm-hmm. having a chat at gulam mohammed sheikh's house and bupen is going to be this we'll all be sitting there like little mice you know but listening you know and then be bupen and gulam will be you know arguing about something and timothy will be saying something it was just so natural it was so much about the fact of just dipping your fingers and toes in the water and not worrying that you're going to you know burn yourself and i think that 
that is really what taught us so much. So, mm -hmm. you know, we would be suddenly told, you know, whether it would be Vasu or whether it would be me or Suresh or something, it didn't matter which which year you belong to. You know, Gulam will call you or Jyoti Bai will call you and say, you know, the so-and-so is coming and just take them for some dal and chawal in the canteen, you know, they're missing home. So you'll be sitting there, you know, you know, like, okay, I've got my theory class. But that little interlude where you'd be sitting and chatting with somebody, you know, would be giving you something, would be gifting you that moment in time where it was also another kind of an instruction Today, mm -hmm. learning has become so compartmentalized. You know, you go, you go to your class. For us, the faculty existed from sunrise to the next sunrise. It never mm -hmm. closed. Mm -hmm. And you see us all there, you know, all pretending to be these great little artists, all of us, you know, completely silly people. But that, that avatar that you took on, you know, that you believed that you were so important to the world and you had to do things, propelled you to work and propelled you to find through the disciplines of that kind of rigor, you know, the many hours yep. within which you honed your skills. You know, you talk about skills, that's how you honed your skills. Yep. You honed skills that were particular to you, you know. You yep. read material that somebody would come and say, oh, that you must read that book. And then I would poo poo and say, no, no, I don't want to read that book. I'm going to read this, you know. And then you'd have this kind of sharing, you know, that, and then you have these arguments about why this, this book is better to read at this time than that. You know, it, you didn't just go to a review and check it out. Yeah. It's not about checking out reviews. It was actually yeah. you deciding to read something and then taking it as an offering to the time when you're sitting and eating, you know, roti and sabji with 500 flies flying around you and you're mm -hmm. talking about something before you're stepping into a class. So what I'm trying to conjure over here is that one learned from these um, many, 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 many pulses. And I think that perhaps, again, and I don't want to make it a then and now situation, but there was something about throwing yourself into the middle of the ocean mm -hmm. in terms of allowing things to, cut, to, to touch you. And in, and in doing that, you then uh, were able to sift and to filter what you actually needed for yourself. Yeah. Uh, I think that that taught me a lot of things. So to do a woodcut print or to do a, you know, a, a clay pot, it taught you to hold form. It taught you to feel something. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're never going to be a potter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. I have touched that clay. I remember Tathpur was my, was my uh, sculpture teacher. Mm -hmm. And he said, taste the brick. And I thought, man, this man is batty. You know, why should I taste the brick? You know, like, uh, he wasn't really being that absurd. What he wanted you to understand is that things are, there is another process of experience. Yeah. You know, it's not necessary really that you have to taste the brick, but he was trying to make you in that very young age understand the many, many percolations to experience mm -hmm. and how you, that just making something was not about the, the, you know, the activity of art is not about making something. It's about experiencing and feeling and sifting and figuring out to add and to subtract. And I think that that's been the greatest learning ground for me. So. Have I been inspired? I think I have been humbled. I think um, for me, it has been very important to hold my humility as an individual uh, for myself and to hold it and to recognize that in order for me to hold any significance for myself, I must recognize that the world is so huge and so amazing and so fecund and that there's no point that I, you know, to believe ever that in my span of a lifetime, whether it's 80 years or 85 years, if I live that long, that I am going to be profound at anything. Mm -hmm. I am merely going to scratch the surface. Mm -hmm. And that I think has allowed me to stay alert. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Like, uh, so how, what you learn, uh, what is the difference of um, what you felt that like, uh, 
in uh, education in india like uh, in baroda and then rca uh, royal college of arts like is there any major uh, um, differences you found that like uh, or you learned something from there like majorly you know it um, i certainly did it was difficult mm. to sort of you know uh, uh, quantify it, but let me attempt to mm. i think that i'm very grateful that i did eight years at art school because i did five years in a in a undergraduate program and i did one year of ma waiting to to go yep. to england and then i did two years there so in all eight years um now i'm not suggesting everybody has to go through eight years of college but i think for me it was a very good gestating space yeah and i say this because um you know i think again sujit everybody's uh, maturity comes with their life experiences and i think that as a as the family i came from the the life my own life narrative uh, uh created a certain uh, maturity for me and um i think that that uh, certainly sort of uh, infused itself into the the practice of of being or being an art student so mm-hmm. i i held a, a greater sense of accountability in terms of uh what i wanted to do with my time i talk about time because i think very often uh, that is never really given much consideration you know we just sort of meander through life and i precisely don't do that now um so what i mean by that is that when i went to england i had been fortunate and we won't get into all of that great narrative but i had got many i was well i was fortunate to get into many art colleges both in europe and in america mm-hmm. and i could then choose the one i wanted to and i had always wanted to go to the royal college of art because it held for me uh, a, a certain direction of uh, or and a certain rigor that i thought would be the best to place myself within and so i wanted to really have discourses with peter de francia mm-hmm. i found him to be uh, somebody who had already been engaged with uh, people from india and his own marxist uh, you know premise and his own uh, comprehension of uh, the histories of india and the contemporaneity of what my india was at that time became the best uh, you know situation so when i went to the rca i took with me i took with me a certain baggage you know and i say this again time and time again that any traveler literally you know and therefore i use it as a metaphor never goes very rarely goes without some small some small chota potla you take with you you know thoda sa something and so you do that with your experiences and with where you know you you don't go completely uh, adrift unless unless you are choosing to completely negate your past so i certainly wasn't doing that and so i took the baggage that i needed with me the experiences that i needed and so i was not going to the royal college of art to be taught mm-hmm. i was going to the royal college of art because i knew who i was at that moment mm-hmm. and i wanted to expand upon it very much from a gender perspective because mm-hmm. that is where i found a certain kind of restriction in india you know all my wonderful friends were mostly guys are uh, all within the marxist and socialist traditions of you know political thinking and there was not very much space for you know gender discourse there just wasn't and this was something that had been part of my life existence from you know a, a genealogy of where i come from from my mother's family you know and then in my own uh in my own inquiries and i found that as much as theoretical reading is of course an essential it's not necessary the journey that is was going to fulfill me within those inquiries there is a point after which you know because i think that theoretical writing also is very culture specific and especially with gender you know gender uh uh inquiries in relation to say you know asia or you know the the asian subcontinent is very different from no. what they do in some other space and especially in the 80s and 90s and i was very interested in certain kind of political things like the greenham common you know uh protest by women and so a lot of you know uh sort of female writers i was interested in certain you know uh american 
black writers. And I felt that it would be, you know, to go to a, a, a place like the RCA under the tutorage of Peter de Francia, who accepted to tutor me for my entire period of time. Normally you have a tutor and then, so he was my main principal tutor and all the rest were kind of, you know, subsidiary. I had John Golding, some wonderful people. And I would invite these people and I would have sometimes close to 15 tutors in my tutorial, you know. <laughs> so as Peter would always, uh, you know, laugh, say, oh, when the, when the ballerina says, come, we cannot say no. But, you know, they were very supportive well, and they were very, they were very uh, engaging and nurturing. And I think they were also interested because there have been so many, you know, stereotypes about Asian and Asian students. That I think that in some ways I broke that mold and it allowed for another kind of discourse. So I think that what separates the RCA from the Faculty of Fine Arts for me was that I could exist as an, as an adult in that space, you know, without mm -hmm. the hierarchies that sometimes, you know, you do get within Indian uh, uh, teaching environments. And there, uh, there is there is a much uh, greater uh, in you know informality, but a, a far greater discipline and you know to uh, what and expectations from from your uh, with the what the teachers have with you. So I loved that. I mean, my first session with Peter DeFrancia was six hours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like dead. I was like ready. To another, you know, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. If you cry, like you know, because I was like. I can't take this anymore. It's like six hours. I'm like really tired. But you know, that was it. You know, he obliged me mm -hmm. to wed myself to my own belief. You know, you will stand tall and you will completely become accountable. And I think it is it is with him as my tutor that I also understood the value of language. Okay. Because not language that is all floaty yep. and you know with big words and which is fine if you use it but you know he made me recognize that every word you use holds weightage and so every line you draw every thought you think it's something you don't separate from yourself you don't take lightly mm -hmm. and i and i think that i should i would really uh oh oh my the discipline of articulation to to being in london Thank you. And uh, so, uh, when it comes to your work, uh, especially in the early works, like it's uh, <clears throat> it's somehow connected to the the last word which you are uh, talking about. You know, every word is has a weight. Uh, you know, uh, you know, early works of yours, like uh, in a single surface, in a single uh, uh, plane, there are many things happening, uh, many events, and many uh, you know, like actions. Uh, and also very expressive and the figure looks uh, very expressive and uh, very melancholic uh, in a way. And some of it's look like uh, lost in thoughts or something. But in uh, after that, there is a point, uh, 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 there is a protagonist sort of a um, figure which comes in most of your work and uh, maybe early or uh, not early, late uh, 90s and 2000s. Uh, it become more, uh, the figure look more confident and uh, uh, they look uh, very calm and composed and very heroic in, in a way. So how do you see this evolu evolution? And uh, 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 do you see the, the, the early works are more like, um, mm, mm, you know, like something a little more easy to, uh, you know, uh, articulate, uh, make it uh, conceive and then when it comes to the the second phase or the middle, uh, you are more carefully chosen the figure and um, uh, how do you see this evolution in, in a way? You know, if I, I would have to, um, thank you. I, you know, you articulate that very well. Uh, no, what I would say Sujit is that, you know, it, it's via the notions of my preoccupation. So if I, if I look at the eighties, okay. If I, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about what I see as seminally my first body of work, because maybe you all are uh, not aware of it. Those, a lot of it are in museums today in yep. the West, but since we are not got visuals, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of this and that. 
But I started off, so let me just talk about it in a more abstract way so that those who may not have the vision in front of them can understand it. Yep. I start my, 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 my work that I hold myself accountable for, so which is like the, the, you know, which represents me as an artist, even though I was in art school, uh, comes from my last year of being in uh, my final year, my fifth year at art college. And so those works were like sort of very photographic in a way. I was painting about my son, uh, my, my a broken marriage. And so they were, they were works like sort of uh, being in, in, in lost in Eden in a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're quite interesting uh, in the sense of that uh, they are diagrammatic of an inside world, claustrophobically pretty. Uh, because the more you look at it, the more you start feeling you can't breathe. So I think there was already a psychological re a resonance that I was uh, applying and, and using devices within the, 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 within the ideas of a narration uh, in a different way. So uh, don't forget that I'm a product of the Faculty of Fine Arts who, uh, you know, it was a wonderful time of discourse that was happening there, very focused on, you know, the narrative uh, tradition, the, the new narrative tradition or the narrative school or the Baroda school as we are going to be. But I was all, much as I loved those works and much as I grew in its sort of, you know, lap, I was also not very uh, drawn to wanting to have episodical, you know, narrativity in my work. But then I always, uh, I, I would, or I know that I live and die as a figurative artist. I think because if you're born in a country like India, where everything manifests itself from your human existence, I don't know how much I could part with that as the late motif of uh, my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So that was really the beginning of of my uh, mature language, or you know, start the starting of my career, if you want to use such a word. I then uh, sort of took a sabbatical in a way because I was one year in the, in the MA program and I had this, oh, I've always had a wonderful connection with uh, Jyoti Bhatt who, you know, had always was one of the most feminist people I have ever known and I've ever kind of uh, um, engaged with. And he understood that I just really wanted to get out of the classroom. And so he offered me his private studio in the faculty, which was, used to be, number of the teachers have this on the corridor that that went towards the library so i had this wonderful space where i could breathe you know i could just breathe and do whatever i wanted to do and i did a set of 33 watercolors which would and i had never used watercolor ever before except dabbling it in it at, at a classroom level and i did these 32 masks and I, that was my first uh, solo show which i had and uh I talk about that because that becomes the sort of in between before I went to the RCA and when I went there, um, you know, the six hour conversation I had with, with Peter was because he was seeing some one or two works that I've done and he said, you know, he's like, what are you doing kind of thing and I said, you know, I need to purge, I need to purge, I don't want to continue because I could continue doing these you know, watercolors, which were very much you know, well received, I didn't want that, this was a kind of chewing, I was chewing on something and I needed to spit it out and I needed to let what I wanted to extract from that be taken. And so uh, that led me to a very fractured and very violent and very aggressive language that dealt with talking about, you know, fragmentation and a kind of, you know, the, the underbelly of life, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. and I would use you know, motives like rape and violence and, you know, masturbation and, you know, you just name it. And um, I was doing six feet by three feet watercolors when nobody was doing something like that. And, and you know, it yeah. was something that just, it, I needed to do it. I wasn't concerned, you know, whether it was, you know, fashionable to do it or not. And it was wonderful to be in a place where you could have access to, to material. And so, um, those works were like, like the watershed for me and the created allowed me to discourse about how I was looking at the, the violence within which 
Um, Abhimanyu, can I request you to ask the gentleman to leave your studio, the little child? I'm getting extremely disturbed by that. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, um, um, yeah, so that that was a phase in which I was looking at how, um, you know, the the I, how do you look at the the, the space of history? Mm -hmm. What it has done within, you know, to talk, how do you talk about patriarchy? How do you talk about that? It was important for me to, to try to find for myself a vocabulary mm -hmm. that did that. And then I uh, came back to uh, India and again, I needed to purge because, you know, for me, it's something where I don't want to be sort of, I didn't want to be touching something too long because mm -hmm many things that were preoccupying me at that time with the central focus for me of was gender and will remain that again it's part of my dna i'll die with that as well but the, the, a time came when you know i worked on these very large tableaus in a way uh where where the the the, the space of the woman mm -hmm. started shifting to become uh, something that you had to look at in, in centrality. And so those very large paintings, those huge oil paintings that were often eight feet by six feet, uh, there's uh, one at the Peabody Museum right now that is on exhibition, so you know it would be easy for people to look at. It's called The Shedding of Innocence. So I would make references to certain things like the odalesque. You know, I would look at the manner in which women had been used or looked at or viewed in art. So for mm -hmm. example, I never use the word nude. I always use the word naked. Mm -hmm. so the things there was a kind of paradigm shift for me that as an artist it was not just about me as an individual it was also me within a collective it was how do you place a feminist space that is also to do with the collective inquiry yep. of uh, work and ideation that you're doing and then i think you know what you're referring to is this other thing that i started to need to you know because for me, the woman has not been a victim. Yep. The woman has been oppressed. There's a difference for me. Mm -hmm. But I would never, the, the spirit of the woman throughout centuries, you know, cross cultures, you know, epitomizes this amazing ability to resurrect the, the female spirit, the Shakti that we talk about, which exists yep. in every culture. And so to me, no woman is ever a victim. She herself doesn't choose to be that. Whether society you know, imposes the belief that she is, is secondary to me. It is not some, it is not a identity that women assume themselves. Even if you are completely battered, even if you are completely uh, um, manipulated into any kind of a state of, uh, uh, which does not hold the a required dignity to your gender. You are still not a victim. And I hold very, very, you know, uh, emphatic views on that. And so it was important for me as a painter, as an artist, to inject that into my own uh, dissemination. And I wanted, therefore, to bring the sense of celebration where you mm -hmm. hold the... Uh, where you disallow for your consumption and to make, as you call it, the protagonist. Yep. Uh, I would just say that it is, uh, you know, the figure of, uh, the figure that holds its own victory. You know? Okay. Okay. I don't know if I've answered you, Sujit, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but we, without visuals, and as we discussed, we, yeah. I was very keen to show this, yeah. I've done this, I've done that. Yeah. I think it's important, you know, um, to, uh, for me as a painter, it's been important. You know, sometimes I say, Sujit, I'm a bit like a writer. <laughs> yeah. 
that it's easier for people to understand what writers do. Yeah. <laughs> you have a, a, a territory. Yeah. I am an, a painter whose territory is extremely uh, sacred to me. Mm -hmm. And it is immaterial whether others find interest in it or whether it is you know, part of a trend or not. I am so delighted to look mm -hmm. at all types of art. That mm -hmm. is not the issue at all. I love it. And it can be something so far removed from languages that I may use. Mm -hmm. Having said that, my engagement with, with my territory is sacred for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, adding to that, like there is a, uh, you know, like uh, somehow you are breaking that narration uh, uh, in your in your pictorial frame. You know, like uh, it, there is no linear narration. There is no such direct uh, narration. Mostly the figures are mediation um, to something. Yes. So how do you, uh, uh, you know, how do you look at that? Because um, mostly Indian uh, paintings, the, especially the um, miniature, especially. They are, they are, they have, they, they hold some narration. So how do you break that uh, in a way? Interesting. Um, you know, Sujit, I think that um, we exist by need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> isn't it? We exist by need, isn't it? Um, so I think that um, my need was to be able to. Uh, oblige a viewer yep. to, um, to be held within the uh, territory of intention that I wanted to place. And in order to, for, for that to be received, I felt the need to pare away and to reduce mm -hmm. and to, to hold a certain kind of stillness. So, you know, um, many people uh, refer to the, the the backspace of my work as yeah. background. I don't call it a background. For me, it's a kind of space of divinity. It's like mm -hmm. infinite. Mm -hmm. And in order for this to be uh, uh, read without the, in order for for the the deliverance I am making through the figure, mm -hmm. uh, for that to be read without it being confined to a locale. Mm -hmm. I take everything away and allow it to exist in a sort of infinite space. Because by doing that, in some ways, I am creating um, another consciousness of communication where the gesture, the stillness, the gaze uh, all become things that are evo evoke and uh, allow you if you have uh, chosen to create a familiarity with my work mm -hmm. to decode the like the personal lexicon mm -hmm. that uh, i am putting together as my dictionary of of language mm -hmm. okay so i see a great influence in uh, from indian painting uh, in your indian miniature especially in your, your in your work but I found more interesting that like uh, uh, most, more than that, I found as a uh, great influence from Indian sculpture because, uh, because uh, you saw uh, some sort of a balance in a, in a way and also uh, you respect the, the gravity, you know, there is a balance in it. So it's not like the figures are not floating, you know, they are grounded more. Like they, they, if you can make it in a sculpture also, like uh, there is, there is a perfect balance, you know, like in terms of the, their action. And so how do you like, uh, how do you arrive in it? You know, because it's, uh, you are more mostly influenced by Indian sculpture or, or like mostly solar uh, bronze so, or something like, yeah, which I found very, a very, uh, a very balanced and, and very organically, you know, like it's, there is no artificial, uh, uh, what do you call that? Like there is no, uh, uh, not something which imposed to make balance, but it's, it's, it looked like very organically, it's, it's grown uh, something like a, as a tree or something like that. No, I, I uh, thank you. It's so like, nice that, uh, you know, I suppose this is the joy of talking to a, a friend and a painter, no? You have sort of... <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 
explained. Uh, so thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, we all have our love affairs, don't we? No? Yeah. And it's difficult to know why you uh, are drawn to things. I will start off by saying, Sujit, that here I would give a great deal of credit to the magic of uh, the art history that I learned under the uh, tutorage of Gulab Muhammad Sheikh. Mm -hmm. uh, I was lucky to have him as an art history teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, he became a painting teacher after I left. Okay, okay. Uh, and I must say that uh, there is a person who um, completely gifted to me uh, a genealogy of belonging by the manner in which he taught art history. Mm -hmm. He didn't maybe teach art history. He made art history come alive, you know? Yeah. Every year that I live and every year, because I'm 62 now, every year that I live, I realize just how much, you know, that enthusiastic man at, you know, the middle of the, uh, you know, 45 degree summer who'd come in day after day mm -hmm. and make idiots like me, you know, find this wonderful sense of magic. So I have to say that because uh, art history opened up yep. uh, and beckoned me. Yep. And unlike maybe other uh, artists or other colleagues of mine, I'm not necessarily referential. Art history is where I walk every day. It's where I jostle and, you know, it's like a marketplace for me. I go and I, you know, push around and I have my chai in art history kind of, you know. It's a, it's a place of, of dwelling for me. And um, I am a visual individual. Mm -hmm. And I think therefore, again, I'm so grateful to the many opportunities I've had to travel. Because... Uh, museums, though we have our love-hate relationship with them, you know, one because of all the factors that they plunder and they keep, but on the other hand, they keep and they give back to you in some other strange way. And so I have, I have recently, in fact, um, you know, people go to Thailand to eat and, and uh, frolic on the beaches. Thai, uh, Bangkok has some of the most beautiful museums. Oh. And I, you know, have been there twice or thrice. Um, uh, just to spend time in those museums. They are just amazing. And I, the moment this COVID thing is over, I'm going to go back there again. And they have these beautiful sculptures. Another place that I delighted in visiting was Korea, where you chance upon things that you don't expect to see. You know that you're going to come across things in the Met and in, you know, in, you know, in Britain and whatever. Yep. So these chance encounters, with things that you sort of instinctively know about and then you come to. Yeah. So, you know, the Sarabai Museum, they are some of the most beautiful sculptures, you know, mm -hmm. that you want to just, you know, quietly thieve and take away because they're just saying something to you and you leave part of yourself with them. So I think that um, you marry yourself to things. Mm -hmm. uh, you graft your love affairs and you find your, your space of um, conversation yep. without it being something very orchestrated. Mm -hmm. Because if something is too orchestrated, at least for me, mm -hmm. uh, I know the direction I'm walking in, you know, I know that I bought a ticket to go to a particular destination, but you know, the meandering within that destination, uh, yep. to that destination is also part of this incredible, incredible space of learning. Yesterday, for example, we just family, we went to, uh, to Champanier with uh, Jairam Podova, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who's a um, dear, dear, beloved friend of ours. And we went and we just spent, you know, four hours at Champanier, just looking at things that, and I've been to Champanier like you know, many, 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 many times. But every time you go and you look up, when you see this wonderful carving and you see the manner in which this, you know, uh, the Sultanate 
dome has been made, it is once more given to you as a new gift. Yep. As you notice something, you also suddenly notice the way a bird is sitting over there. It's like something so extraneous that nobody else is noticing, but is yours. Or you see this, you know, green parakeet, you know, sitting somewhere, the color of that next to the stone. So these are chanced upon love affairs and you bring it to your art uh, like whispered dreams in a way, you know? Yeah. So I don't know whether I've answered you. Because no, I, I think it's it's almost like uh, you are going to somebody's uh, library, you know, like your own library, you know, almost like what you have it, even if it is a bigger one. Uh, but if you are going to someone's library, if you, uh, I felt that most of the time when I go to uh, residencies, you know, like they may have a, a book session and then you chance upon something which is, which helps you to uh, grow, which actually I'm missing in Bombay, you know, like I, I have a very small library, which is very orchestrated. You know, I know that what, what is here. So that's some, some, something which is very interesting. And uh, I wanted to ask something about your practice. You know, how do you start a book? I know that you are not uh, doing any sketch or um, you, are, you, you are not doing that. You just enter. So it's more like a decision, you know, there is no, uh, 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 oh, it's like a, uh, if I'm asking like, how do you start and then uh, something happening in the, in, the, in the surface, you keep listening that and then you go with that or it's almost like a, it's you decided something and there is, uh, uh, there is no such, uh, uh, mm, you know, like mm, uh, you completely decide at uh, the whole surface and then you go for, you go with or accidents, uh, you are welcome with the accidents, uh, like. You know, um, I'm going to answer it starting from a very funny premise. Mm -hmm. um, when you know that you have very little time on earth, and I firmly believe that, I live every day of my life like it's my last day on earth, truly Sujit. Yeah. I pack in so much and as everybody knows, you know, I, I, I'm a, a, a person who is a very devoted mother. So I brought up a child and I have now a grandchild. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I am completely um, engaged with utilizing time in a very um, understood and comprehended way. And for me, um, that has obliged and forced me to be very alert and very clear and very decisive. This in no way is a, is a statement to talk about the idea of surety, not at all. I am the most perhaps unsure or, you know, as vulnerable as anybody else. But to me, those are things that you deal with. It's like you trip and you know you've tripped, but you, you stop yourself from falling and you steady yourself and you walk on. You know, you don't stand there saying, I tripped, I tripped, I tripped. So for me, because I work every day of my life, unless I am in a hospital, you know, I've actually curated a show from a hospital when I was the patient. So, but if I'm, you know, been with my, I've been a caregiver to my parents and things like that. So when there's certain circumstances where you, I can't wait and I don't, paint when I, when I travel. I do funny drawings when I travel, very mm -hmm. strange drawings. And I, and I do a lot of one line conversation with myself about an image or something, which are very private. And they, they're always on envelopes and kept here and there in my studio. So they don't amount to, you know, being something that are exhibition, you know, worthy or anything like that. But that's what I do when I travel. But every day that I, if I'm going to start to work, I know. So if I'm going to, for many, many years, I uh, work from project to project. I can't paint, uh, you know, in a sort of meaningless way. I, so that's why when people say, do you have a work to you know, provide for an exhibition? I don't, because I work from project to project. Um, and so if I'm going to have a solo show, or if I'm going to work, you know, for a project at the Indian Art Fair, I, I, you know, flesh my idea out because my idea will come from the everyday thinking, mm -hmm. everyday thinking. My head is, I'm very neat outside because my head is completely crazy. <laughs> I'm a complete mad woman up here, absolutely. But I look so calm because I'm all the time, you know, mm -hmm. I write, you can't read my writing because my writing is so bad. So I have to, so, you know, um, so 
I have thousands of things that spill out of my head. I'm like mm. a letter writer at a at a station. I can I can t- tell you many, many, many things because I have mm. thousands of images that are there, and I will never finish painting them. But what you do is you you it's like it's like so many things in my kitchen but i would pick up five to put it together to make it presentable to offer to you and i think that's a strange and funny way to put it but when i decide that i am doing a project then i i gather from the madness in my head the many things that i want to say and then i start refining them and then i start placing it in in ways that i desire to so for example um you know, uh, my exhibitions are always with a title and the title becomes the, the title of the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right now I'm working uh, on a extended series of work called Home is Wherever You Are. Yeah. Okay. It itself becomes the territory, no? Yeah. So, okay, so what actually worry you like when you paint, like what you what you scared of? or when you paint, you know, what, which part of the painting or, or maybe different encounter in different time, but uh, there will be something which constantly, uh, uh, you know, knock in, in, in my case, like the format, you know, like maybe one inch, two inch difference, but maybe you can't even identify that. But that's really a thing for me, you know, because it's, it's not to your retina, it's you have to go something, yeah. Um, I think for me, balance is everything. Yeah. Yeah. I can immediately know if something is not quite there. Okay. And uh, um, I tease Surendran. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> something that I will come to later the delight of having a partner you can, you know, who's yeah. uh, wonderful to talk to. So uh, I'm, you know, it's a joke. I'm arrogant in that when I draw, mm. You know, why should I not draw what I want to draw? Mm-hmm. Yep. What I'm trying to say is that for years and years, uh, or let me let me rephrase that. You know, uh, I taught myself something very important that I believe uh, has has been uh, the thing that allows me to translate. I look at all objects like I'm touching them. I look like I touch. Yeah. And so I can close my eyes and I can tell you what a drooping breast would be or mm-hmm. what a, a stooping shoulder is or what a worn out lock is. And so I have this, you know, wherever I go, I look, I can tell you the, the, the manner in which a leaf that is dry is, is you know, fragile and bristly, you know, it's yeah. like an old yeah. parchment skin. Yeah. There are thousands and thousands of things like that. And so when you sit to draw, even when it is a drawing that is pared down, so when you want to show something, when you want to show the shoulder or you want to show the sense of the, it all of this converges to, mm-hmm. to you, that accuracy of knowing exactly where your hand translates, how you have internalized it. Yeah. And so as a teacher, much to the, you know, like, oh, what is she doing? I insist that my students have to draw. You will draw, I don't care whether you never touch a pencil for the rest of your life, but you will draw that boring chair. And this is what I learned from somebody like Nasreen. Mm -hmm. So Nasreen, you know, I mean, when was she doing anything figurative? And she was my teacher. I mean, she was such a strict teacher. And she would say, draw the chair, draw this, draw that. And I'd say, why does she do this? But unless you understand the structure, the skeletal being, you know, like wood, if you look at wood, yeah. all wood is not the same. Yeah. You know, so it's that kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's almost like uh, somebody saying that, like, you should, one should understand that, like, uh, when you look at and paint uh, a bird, uh, uh, one should understand and respect that it is a flying thing. You know, it should fly. You know, it's not a 
it's not a piece of stone even if it is the same weight but it should fly so somewhere it's we are in that so maybe this is the last question i maybe uh, we are into our end of uh, how did you uh, how did you uh, uh, how did this uh, collective uh, studio evolve and how did you reach that uh, uh, you wanted to you know start or something like uh, how how this idea comes to you like you know i said to you everything is need based yeah and um i uh i had been gifted by my teachers and by the environment i grew up in a great deal of uh spaces that accommodated me to be able to learn in different ways mm -hmm. but when i came back to india uh, in 1984 i found a slight shift in an environment i think you know uh the individual had begun to had begun to sort of raise itself and i'm not so certain that uh educational institutions remained as rigorous as they should have and i began to see many young people in desperate need of uh wanting to be heard and wanting yeah. to have a rigor wanting to be held accountable uh i was i i was really tough teacher no, i don't know i don't take any money i don't take any art you know i pour my money into my students you know all of that but i expect you to work nothing less than 16 hours a day mm -hmm. and i expect you to believe in yourself and so we felt you know the, the collective studio baroda has existed from 1984 in very strange ways on my carpet you know i had one at one time we had one bathroom you know we've had people staying for three months with us we had a, a, a student who had tuberculosis and you know my mother was saying oh my god you know mithun is there what you know we've done from florence nightingale to teaching to fundraising to you know um funding thesis uh, you name it and we've done it and i actually it's interesting it's only in this last year that one we've been asked about it and we've and it's being documented and things like surendran and i actually choose not to talk about it and in the early stages we would actually say do not in, you know do not acknowledge us we don't want to because we don't we didn't register it as an organization because we didn't want tax benefit we um you know we don't want it to appear as though there is something in it for us i think that you have to recognize need without somebody being so needy that they fall off the radar yeah you know yeah. Uh, you don't have to be poor to need yeah. no and and there is when i was studying maybe i was lucky i don't know but there was a certain quota so to speak where emotional sustenance was there without you having to articulate it mm -hmm. and so there was a greater humanness within the traditions of teaching okay cared for you know mm -hmm. industry would come up to me and say, how are you you know or you know jyoti bai would see that i get a photography assignment because i you know from the age of 18 i have been completely economically independent not pocket money i have earned my own living so you know he'd say that uh, somebody would come to him for some marriage photographs and he'd say oh i'm very busy you know like reka just come here i would you be able to do this and this person really i don't know this this woman <laughs> and she's very she she'll do it you know this kind of utter belief you know and yeah. stood up to that but you know there was this wonderful nurturing environment where you didn't have to have some begging bowl out there yeah. when i came back i found people were not that open to wanting to give spaces to individuals or be uh to be a bridge i think surendran and i have wanted to be a bridge nothing more nothing less i don't know whether you can teach anybody anything except to make them realize what potential they have within themselves you know so you know i have in recent years you know when we had our most recent entrant into the collective studio baroda has been ankush safaya 
And then there was no place for him in that space. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh shit, what do I do? So I said, okay, you come into my studio. He so ended up de- tripping over this young yeah. artist, you know. Yeah. But okay, what difference does it make? You know, I mean, uh, it's not a big issue. I'm going to die someday. You know, like, if you can't make <laughs> art, you know, with some disturbances, it's not a big problem. And I think that that kind of belief, um, allows people to grow their own wings, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, you know, wonderful session, which I, I was a little tensed, you know, when we, we had a <laughs> discussion before that, like, but it is, uh, for me, it's a little more easy because you are the one who made that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Utter pleasure. Yeah, so let's ask, uh, let's take some questions from uh, from the chat and then. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, excellent, engaging, wonderful conversation. Yeah, so we have few questions. I will take it up. Uh, I will order it in a way that, you know, it relates to whatever has uh, gone till now, not necessarily in the order in which they have asked. So Dipali Shah asked this. Uh, Rekha, you used to be an excellent photographer. Our family still have a very poignant picture of a street child. What happened to that aspect? Hi, Dipali. Thank you for listening in. Um, Dipali and I go back uh, many, many years. And so we actually were childhood friends. Now, to answer your question, Deepa, uh, you know, I did photography to be able to earn my living. And so it was important for me to find, uh, because, you know, uh, I come from a sort of very elitist background. So it, there were no malls or things like that. So where would a person like myself be able to get a job, you know? And uh, I was very determined. So either I was going to do silk screen printing and there was already, you know, a lot of that happening. And so I took up the camera and studied under Jyoti Bhai so that I could take, you know, do photography in order to earn a living. And so I put down my camera the moment I got my scholarship. And I, I have uh, since then never used my camera uh, in a professional sense. But interestingly, I um, have gone back to using photography as a material within my art. And so that became came to me because Surendran gifted me a camera when we were in South Africa so that I could take photographs of my cat because I love her. <laughs> <laughs> and it opened up something so this is that whole thing Sujeet about you know this coincidental yep. I never thought I would use a camera again mm. uh, and then it just was something I have I loved photography I love photography I loved photography but I think it was so closely associated with having me having to earn my living and you know it took those many hours of my day away and whatever I didn't have the need to anymore and so uh, yes and I think that love for um for documentary filmmaking uh, comes from, you know, the love of the camera. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you yeah. for the nice here. Yeah, we haven't touched the early, later work, you know, like we, which you use the photography as a major uh, resources for the, for your work, which I, which we haven't talked about, but it's, it's a never ending. I felt that, <laughs> <laughs> which I, another 40 years <laughs> maybe yeah <laughs> okay thank you interesting point yeah okay uh, next one another on a personal note only from projecta so she's asking does your vocabulary change or grow while traveling through your work process if yes how do you deal with it I think there is always projecta, a sense of assimilation, no? I think that uh, there is never a moment in time when you don't unconsciously uh, uh, get patinaed by things, you know? You, you, things sort of come and rest on you in ways. It could be an, a, a film you watch, something that you don't even like, you know? Uh, I recently watched White Tiger, which I thought was a terrible film. I'm sure I'm going to be criticized for saying that, but anyway, it was a terrible film. But there are a lot of images from that film that have stayed with me, you know, sort of frames from that film that have stayed, have stayed with me. Now, 
does that in a way infiltrate the space of the vocabulary that you then use within your art? I do believe so, but perhaps not in, a, in that direct and immediate way. But I think it does. So, you know, many people have asked about the pandemic, you know. Now, I have been working every day as I normally do. In fact, quieter because then I, I wasn't tempted to travel and I was supposed to be abroad and all of that. So all of that got cancelled. So that was okay. I had more time to work. So has the pandemic affected me? Has it in, encroached into my consciousness? Does it create other vocabularies? Of course it does, you know, because the... Uh, the vocabulary that you um, that you gather comes from from what falls from the trees in a way. No, you if you're gathering produce somewhere, you go to the land and you see what the land gives to you. Uh, if that becomes an allegory or a metaphor for the way in which you you know. It, who would have thought two years ago that we would have been in this kind of situation today? This is a kind of situation that has affected everyone. You know. Uh, in positive ways and negative ways, who knows, you know, but it's affected everyone. Uh, what will come tomorrow, who knows, you know. Uh, I used to be, um, again, I'm going to receive, you know, criticism for this, I suppose, from some Myanmar individual, but, you know, I was a great supporter of Aunt San Suu Kyi. I mean, the amount of work that I have dedicated to her at the time when she was, you know, incarcerated. When she came out and when she did what she did and made the political decisions that she did that created the genocide, you know, I was so betrayed. I did not know where, where to take my belief and where to put it. So you are going to encounter all of these things that change your vocabulary, that change your, you know, that, uh, that force you. What happened to the Babri Masjid? You know, what happens in, you know, the farmers' uh, st uh, strike, protest? Everything every day affects you and in, in, it Im impacts your vocabulary. Do I then paint a tractor in my painting? No, I'm not going to paint a tractor in my painting, but it is affecting me and it does. So it is the subtext and how do you milk that subtext? How do you strain it to allow it to hold significance in the manner that matters to me? So I think that's the best way that I can answer it. Good. Thank you. So next question is more of a general art and art practice, not specific to Regaji. Uh, so Dr. Sina, she is asking, do you think realism or realistic art has gone out of fashion? Is creativity, vision, and conceptualization more important in making one an artist than skill? So there are three questions in that. Let <laughs> I, I'm not a soothsayer. I'm not somebody with a crystal ball. So I'm sure somewhere sitting, there's somebody sitting somewhere uh, doing work that is extremely realistic and which would be quite amazing and quite phenomenal. I have seen some amazing things at the Kochi Biennale. I can't remember the artist, I, please forgive me, but there were these, there was images of, you know, corpses. I can't remember the artist. So do, anyway. No corpses. So, you know, I can't, I can't remember whatever name you say, I would be sort of agreeing with it, but anyway. And so um, there is, what is trend? I don't know. Maybe I'm an artist or a, maybe I'm just an individual who doesn't subscribe to trend. No, I wear saris and you know, who cares about trend? I just have to, you know, live. And I think that art is like that. Art has a life and it will live. It, uh, you know, um, if somebody finds meaning in what they're doing, uh, there will be people to receive it, you know? And so in certain instances, uh, the, the, the work, you know, needs the concept, needs the ideation, needs the presentation in a particular way, it needs an experience that will, you know. So everything becomes, um, just close everything becomes relevant in accordance with the need of that, of that uh, deliverance presentation, whatever you want to call it, you know? Uh, so I'm not somebody who creates hierarchies. Um, I don't believe in fashions. I don't believe in trends. I believe, and I'm going to use something that again is a bit difficult. I don't like this word, okay? So I'm, I'm going to apologize before I use the word. 
this is a stupid word, but I can't find any other word to say. I believe in the sort of, uh, okay, maybe not, I was going to use the word sincerity. All right, let me take that word off. I believe in the purposefulness of the person's intention. You know, I'm not here to decide uh, whether the person's intention, you know, uh, uh, lacks credibility. I have the right to look at something from aesthetical critique. That's my right. I don't have to impose it on somebody else. So if I'm a curator, I will have a sort of territory by which I find meaning and create the argument and peg the discourse and frame the, the presentation. You know, I mean, I had a, you know, a show, one of the shows that I have great delight that I did was of Vasudeva Lakitam's work, uh, which I think is really a museum quality exhibition, not because I curated, because he's a great, you know, his art was such and it, it delivered itself that way. If you are uh, smart, you know how to, you know, so I can make you anda budri and make you, you know, seduce you. <laughs> It's how you, you know, how you offer it and how you present it. So I think it's, uh, so excuse me for answering it in the strange way. I don't believe in trends. I don't believe in any of this. I believe that you will go to see something because you see purpose in it. Um, I believe that a democracy of any kind should allow for multiple pluralistic uh, um, presentations. I think that, you know, good art exists and bad art should exist too. You know, it's okay. You know, in order for us to know that something is good, you need a little bit of the bad. I've always said to my students, you need some bad teachers as well. You'll be able to learn something from that as well. You know, <laughs> it cannot be perfect. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So next one from Deepa Gopal. Uh, I think she's referring to that name of that um, exhibition a series of works which you mentioned like home is wherever you are so she's telling it's beautiful and it reminds her of Serena has me's home is a foreign place and letters from home now she's asking a question what is your view of home when home has and is becoming an unsafe place for many women no that's precisely it uh, who is the person who asked the question who is the Deepa, Deepa Gobal She's a curator. Uh, she has curated some shows, if I get it right. Thank you, Deepa. It is exactly that. It is, uh, you know, home is wherever you are. It's precisely that, isn't it? Because it is got all these nuanced meanings, you know, of uh, the, the safety and unsafety, the belonging and non-belonging, you know. So what happened to, uh, it, it's not a given. The title is not sort of like a, a given it is actually multi-layered so for example you know i mean we talked about the pandemic i have seen first of all they're not migrant laborers so they're people who are in my city you know allowing you know individuals to have uh, things constructed without their skills and without their abilities there would be no space for such work but we label them migrant workers like get lost now go you know go home and I have seen them with these little strollies, you know, going like in hundreds, you know, and, and you feel so amputated at a moment like that because you just, there's nothing you can do except, you know, sponsor things and, you know, but what is that? You know, I mean, like, what is that? Even if I emptied my bank accounts, there's nothing that I could have done. I'm not rich enough, I suppose, to have made sufficient changes and significant, you know. Uh, so, this is a, a territory that talks about home is wherever you are. I mean, you know, are you the immigrant? I, you know, you know, are you? I, I had a wonderful, well, I don't know if it's a wonderful, I had an experience where I was asked to go in Liverpool to a maximum security uh, prison, all male prison, to talk about feminism. So I was like, you know, like, do I want to take this invitation up? You know, these are rapists, these are murderers. You know. and I thought, it was like, why am I sitting here as judge and jury and God and all of these things rolled into one? These are people who are incarcerated. They have, you know, they are being held accountable for their whatever atrocities, uh, crimes, or, you know, they have committed. And it was because it was an alternative kind of prison. And I'm talking about this because I, I think I see it as a link up to what I'm saying, what you asked. And so I went there and I was humbled because, you know, there, are, there were these prisoners who were talking about Maya Angelou and things like that. So, you know, you talk, you can't typecast people. You can't, you know, decide and believe that you know things uh, familiar or unfamiliar. You are always in a process of learning. And so I thought to myself, you know, I mean, 
those are people who are never going to come out. They were going to live and die there. Um, and what do you do with this? Was many years ago that I went there. What do you do with your life? You know how you know. I would have maybe been too cowardly to address a life. I don't know. And there were these people, interesting, engaging, you know, amazing people, finding a way to find purpose and finding a way to invent and create, you know. Uh, a, a, a sort of pulse for themselves. So I want to look at the spectrum of things. I want to see uh, life, you know, without vulnerability, you don't have strength. Without anguish, you don't have, you know, something that you can hold as victory or, you know, solace, let's say, rather victory, rather than victory. So there's always going to be this sort of sense of this with that. And I think that I'm somebody who wants to keep the window very open in order to be able to see whether I can place my concern to take in more than I imagine is there. Because that's how I will learn. Because the world is so vast, you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a correction. She's a Deepa Kopal is a visual artist and an art blogger. She had curated a show, so I just mistook that she's only curator. I'm sorry for that. Okay, now uh, next question from uh, Georgina Maddox. So it's asking about the collective and the individual. So it has a background to it, as a precursor to it. Just wanted to say that I really thank the collective for the support it gave me on so many levels, emotional, intellectual, and also practical. I just want to say that a collective energy is so empowering. And as someone who is so mad about being an individual, I respect this idea of the collective. Just want to ask Rekha about the two, the collective and the individual. Hi, Georgina. Nice to know you're listening in. <laughs> so I tease uh, Georgina that she's my prodigal daughter. I have many daughters and I have many sons. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, how does I, how would I answer that? I think that to me, it's again, two sides of the same coin. And I think that I'm somebody who uh, firmly, firmly, firmly believes and believes and endorses and lives the practice that uh, my life is not meant just for myself. I'm very, very sure about that. Um, and so my endeavors of, learning and being and existing and uh, partaking of life has to be not just for myself, but to be able to take others along with me. Now, I don't mean that I'm sort of herding, you know, goats and sheep and, you know, people around, but I think that uh, there is a purposefulness to life if you have the humility to recognize that the journey of life is not more own. And for, you know, I have and I understand the history and the psychological and the sociological interpretation of the word individual. So, you know, I state that before I, or the political as well. But I'm talking about something just very simple and very human. To me, I think that you cannot ever imagine yourself to be somebody that can exist unless you are mentally dysfunctional without the kind of integration with others and uh, uh, an interdependency. So I'm going to say something that sounds terrible, but you're not going to be able to use your toilet if all the things around you are not functioning correctly. And we just don't understand this about life when we say, I'm individual, I don't need anybody. You know, so at that very crass level to the very profound level, there is no space in life where just to exist without understanding that there are others around you and to be interlinked with those concerns. For me, family is important, but family is not the only thing. And I think that, you know, I say this very deliberately because many people have invested and very wisely so and, and very uh, wonderfully with this entire thing that you know you give back to your family but you have to give back to your family and you have to see the larger world as your family and you have to be able to find ways that uh give you the opportunity to be able to be supportive 
it's not money alone that supports things. I'm not somebody who's a great check writer. You know, that's an easy thing to do. But you need to have uh, the ability to hold compassion and, and empathy with things around you. And another thing I'm going to say, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of flack from all my friends for saying this, but I'm going to say it. Let's not make uh, too much of an altar out of intellectual pursuits. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a space for that, a very vital space, especially as artists, especially as creative people, especially the world over. Everybody should have that component of hopefully this intellectual rigor that happens. But when we start, you know, creating this exclusivity, the, living a, your life must hold the notions of inclusiveness. I think to be a writer, artist, you know, filmmaker, poet, you are you are continuously straining from the world. If you don't have your ability to understand and hold empathy with the world, what are you straining? What are you straining? If you're looking at the sky, you'll see a very cloudy sky. That's, you know, the pollution that we have. I mean, how are you dislocated? If you're looking at the, the moon, you're, you know, somebody's going and trying to colonize the damn place. I mean, every place that everything around you you are connected to. And I think we have to hold an alertness to it and we have to hold a responsibility and we have to hold a politics to why we exist. But politics can be defined in many different ways. Thank you. One question from Shanti, a part of which actually you addressed uh, during your conversation. She's asking about uh, to share the critical learnings from your teachers and mentors that have guided you in your art practice and career? That would be like asking me to take one drop from the ocean. So, okay, but not, not, it, it, not to say that the question is, doesn't hold its value. Um, I think that, uh, okay, I think I learned very much from, um, uh, growing up in the Baroda Faculty of Fine Arts, the absolute importance of uh, recognizing that contemporary art is not just an urban practice. And I have been taught and I therefore live by the comprehension of knowing that there are multiple art practices in India and all over the world that are uh, not within white cube spaces. They can be, you know, uh, folk, tribal, ritualistic practices that also come under the framework of uh, holding, um, being part of the umbrella of, of being seen and considered as relevant art practices. And I know this to be true of America, of Canada, of Europe, of many places. And I think this is a struggle. Uh, I think perhaps that there may be many other countries, but I think that perhaps one can see that Australia has been one of the few countries that have made uh, the political endeavor to, um, to bridge that gap uh, and have held an atonement, a public atonement for the lack of, uh, of respect that wasn't accorded to those practices that were excluded for so many years. And they did that right from the, I think, you know, 70s and 80s onwards. I think that India did make some inroads into it. We have had, you know, people, you know, create things like, you know, somebody like Swaminathan's endeavor, somebody like uh, Subramaniam's endeavor. They have been uh, um, scholars and uh, thinkers, uh, Pupul Jaikar, many people like that. Uh, I would even include somebody like Rajiv Sethi, you know, unbiased, and I would say that, um, that I have tried to have this sense of inter-engagement um, to create the focus, especially somebody like Swaminathan, you know what I mean? And Subramaniam. So I think that this is what I feel uh, has been one of the most important um, learning that I have had. Um, it's not necessary that it reflects in my art. 
it reflects in how I think. And because I think that way, then therefore I should, you know, it, in it, it inhabits me as an artist, as a painter. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the official questions I was, uh, have finished sort of. I, I would uh, ask one last question, you know, personal question. Okay, <laughs> so you have traveled a lot. You know, you could see that you have uh, traveled all parts of the world. Like, which country or which countries you have visited? You see a, a common man aesthetics or the aesthetics of the public spaces uh, being influenced by the visual art practice of that country. Something when you compared with India. Huh? I don't know whether I understand your question. No, what I mean is like uh, in every country is how the architecture happens or how the public spaces are defined or how the common man views like their houses and their uh, streets and all how it looks like that, that, that aesthetic sometimes have a resemblance of the visual art practice of that country. Uh, like even if you see our houses and all, we'll have something to borrow from our visual art practices. So something like this, people tell when they go to Bali, they kind of see a specific kind of aesthetic. So something which has impressed you when you're going to so many places. Okay, I'm, I'm going to answer this differently because I don't know whether I would be able to specifically say that. Uh, but what I did feel very strongly when I have visited uh, Italy, was that I felt that uh, there was a strong tradition of understanding the respect for the past. And I think that this is something that I feel is hugely lacking in our country. We have such a rich tradition of, you know, from the most refined uh, spaces of, you know, architecture and, you know, monuments to things that are so beautiful, like a banyan tree that will have thread, you know, and it's, you know, this particular banyan tree that I've seen for years, I mean, maybe four decades. So these, these become sort of like, you know, living monuments in a way. But I think that we don't have the ability in India to understand the true relevance of uh, what government uh, intervention needs to be, what private support needs to be, and what public consciousness needs to be. So, you know, when we are happy, We'll go and urinate in the corner somewhere. <laughs> and then we are, uh, take our girlfriend and boyfriend. We'll put one initial somewhere. Or something. Uh, you know, I'm I, I'm very I I live in India by political choice. I'm not going to say I love my country. I have a lot of problems with my country, but I live in India by political choice. I could have lived in other parts of the world. So it's it's my home space that I'm criticizing. You know, it is me and us that I'm criticizing. Um, whilst I, feel, I felt that there was a great sense of pride that the, the people of those cities and towns actually felt, uh, and they live with them, you know, have these handsome men on their motorcycles, you know, zipping with their, you know, Italian girls, but, you know, these monuments and all of this so beautifully maintained and so, so respected, because I think there's an understanding that, you know, sort of, the histories speak to them in more precious ways than we believe our histories speak to us. I mean, I would say one last thing, and I'm sure I'll get into a lot of political problems for this, but um, I think we need to separate, you know? um, we need to separate our political governance from uh, um, interfering in cultural practices. And I think that the ideas of what we understand to be free speech is not necessarily um, blabbering on a television. So let me keep names out. But uh, to actually allow for, or to actually not allow, because you look at that, that's even the wrong word. To have and to encourage and to infuse a, 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 a pluralistic society to hold its cultural practices and to hold its uh, um, contemporary avatars with, with the tamasha that allows you to, to be a little bit braggy, you know, to have the swagger that it's mine, rather than you know, wanting to replace street names and replace, take out this monument and put that monument there and put this. And so we kind of dilute 
the understanding of the narratives of, uh, of time. You can't change history. And I think that politics has to understand that you create new histories and you be engaged with that and allow for the, the mandate and, and the voice of, of, um, of thinking people to guide you uh, and let histories be, you know? And I think that would give value to the truth of what freedom of expression is about. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Regaji, for those well-directed missiles to conclude <laughs> the session. And uh, amazing session. Uh, one person has already asked for part two of Regaji in the next <laughs> talks. Anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway uh, thank you uh, all those who have uh, come today. And actually, we have a good number of uh, viewers also in the Facebook you know, who are seeing that live in the Facebook and the coming days more people are going to watch this. I'm sure this is going to be part of the history. Thank you, Sujit. And I don't have to tell actually formally thanks to Sujit. He is part of uh, our team. And uh, Ragaji, once again, uh, a ton of thanks from the bottom of the heart from all of us and everybody else you know, who have come in this platform and also watched the show in Facebook and who are going to watch in Facebook. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Rekaji, for accepting again. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Narasatha, for giving me this opportunity.